welcome to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility and representation. Basically, how can we help more people to play games and more people to see themselves in the games they play? I'm your host, Laura. I'm a white woman with bright blue hair, shaved on one side, wearing a plain black dress. When I publish a new episode of Access Ability, there'll usually be at least one response on YouTube or Twitter that will say something to the effect of, this was really interesting, but it doesn't personally impact me. That doesn't surprise me. I do a lot of videos about very specific disabilities, and there's a good chance that most people watching the video don't have that specific disability, but I think one thing it overlooks is the fact that even if most of these accessibility settings I talk about on this channel don't impact you today, there's a very good chance that most of them will impact you someday. Your current level of gaming ability and your current lack of disability is not a static thing, and it probably will change as time goes on. Setting aside the fact that anyone could develop a condition or face an injury today that would instantly mean that they require accessibility support when gaming, we're all ageing, and there are some things that come as natural, common parts of ageing that are ultimately going to mean if we want to play video games into our older years, we're going to need accessibility support. From declining hearing and sight, to decreased coordination or increased chronic pain conditions, there are lots of things that are going to impact your ability to play video games that mean that even if you don't need accessibility support today, you probably will in the future, and it's worth caring about it now. So today, on Access Ability, we're going to be talking about gaming and ageing. We're going to talk about some of the conditions that are going to impact people as they age, some of the accessibility support being worked on today that will likely help people as they age, and we're going to talk about the fact that most of the things we talk about on this channel as accessibility support, even if they don't impact you today, they eventually will. The following list of accessibility needs and support solutions for older gamers isn't going to be exhaustive. There's over a year's worth of in-depth videos on this channel going into greater depth on these topics, but the aim of this video is to give an overview of the situation, so that people who currently do not require accessibility support can get a sense of the areas of this industry that might be in their self-interest to see improved. Right now, Nintendo still releases a reasonable number of video games with forced, unavoidable motion controls. This is not a Nintendo exclusive issue, most VR games released today also feature unavoidable motion controls too. As people age, typically a few issues arise that may impact the ability to play games that involve forced motion controls, from chronic pain to reduced mobility and increased fatigue. Nintendo demonstrated with the release of Skyward Sword HD that when they want to, they can think of creative alternatives to motion controls. This is something we should be encouraging, because motion controls will eventually be a barrier to entry that stops many of us playing games. When it comes to VR gaming, many of the tools required to minimise motion requirements are already being worked on by third-party teams, including support for tools where you can automate standing up and crouching using button presses rather than motion, but these need to be standardised by headset manufacturers and game developers to truly be effective. In terms of requiring physical motion to be playable, large amounts of standing or walking can become more difficult with age, and as such, many of you who currently enjoy playing real-world movement games such as Pokemon Go may, over time, find engaging with that style of gameplay more difficult. Pokemon Go introduced a lot of remote gameplay options during the big year inside, that helped players who struggle with walking to play the game from home, but it then rolled them back once the world began to open back up. Those kinds of accessibility support tools are important and will be important to many of us in the years to come. As most of us age, our vision and hearing quality will both begin to decline as well. Most of the support tools we talk about on this channel for deaf and blind players will eventually become important to most people, and as such, pushing for these to be improved is in most gamers' best interests. The Last of Us 2 is still somewhat of a gold standard in this regard, with the introduction of features such as high contrast mode visuals for partially sighted players, and audio cues for sightless players, options to change subtitle size and colour to be more legible, visual cues to show where sounds came from, closed captions with speaker tags, and a whole host of other small but useful features. 
I'd really recommend going back and watching our video about The Last of Us 2, because if you watch it keeping in mind the fact that your hearing and your eyesight over time are likely to deteriorate, you'll likely see how many of the features introduced there will eventually be helpful to most older gamers. Additionally, features such as menu narration, where menu text is read out as you move your cursor, and text-to-speech or speech-to-text for voice chat, help blind and deaf players engage with a wider variety of game types. Very few games right now feature any kind of audio descriptions for gameplay, but that is something that could be a step forward for supporting partially sighted and sightless blind players. Subtitles in our industry also need to be standardised to high quality closed captions, with customisable sizes, fonts, colours, and background opacity levels to be as useful as possible. Even the most skilled gamer today will not be as skilled decades from now, as a variety of aspects of ageing will impact technical ability in games. You don't even have to look at old age to see this happening. Players in StarCraft 2 competitive scenes or fighting game scenes have an age where they stop being competitive, and that's in their 20s and 30s usually, because as early as that you start having issues arise that will lessen your ability to game at the top end. From lessening coordination to reduced muscle strength, chronic pain to increased reaction times, Games will keep the same level of difficulty, while becoming more difficult for you as a player as you age. Difficulty modes and customizable difficulty menus offer support to older players, but there are also more specific ways games can help, such as Forza Horizon 5 offering the ability to slow down your car and the enemy cars on the road, or Celeste offering the same alongside additional jumps and health to players. Automation of actions and simplified control layouts are going to become increasingly important to gamers as they age too for the above reasons. Games with quick time events should offer options to increase timer length, as should games like the Jackbox Party Pack games, and button mashing prompts should have the ability to be swapped for holds or single presses to support older gamers with chronic pain conditions which become more common with age. Muscle strength impacts a few different areas of gaming, but here I'll highlight the weight of handheld gaming consoles and controllers. As controllers get heavier with the addition of new features, it's important that lighter controllers are also supported for players who may struggle to hold something heavy for an extended period of time. When it comes to gaming handhelds, there will always be a balancing act between screen size, power, and weight. More powerful handhelds with larger screens are easier to see if you're partially sighted, but heavier to hold for those with muscle weakness or hand pain. Dedicated accessibility controllers, as well as console level features such as co-pilot mode, can help older gamers keep playing as they age by remapping controls to larger buttons which require less small scale manual dexterity, or allowing a second player to help with a second controller mapped to the same character. As we age and our coordination and fine motor control decrease, accessible packaging will become all the more important. If you're an older person living alone and you struggle to see or to get a grip on a small clear plastic sticker sat flush to a box holding your game console shut, you're likely to have a bad time. But Microsoft has been moving towards having more of their products ship in more accessible packaging, including stickers with a large unstuck edge that's easy to see, easy to grip, as well as ribbons that can be used to lift things out of boxes enough to get your hands underneath them. As memory storage and recall tends to get worse with age, features such as the ability to rewatch cutscenes or read recaps of plot will be increasingly important for many gamers. The ability to pause and save video games is also going to be more important to many players over time for a variety of reasons, ranging from forgetting a game is running on a handheld and the battery running out, through to increased urgency when it comes to using the bathroom. The ability to stop a game at any time, and to not lose progress once it's been made, impacts everyone eventually. Finally, let's talk about financial accessibility. Many of us gaming today are going to have less money available to us in old age than generations before us, due to a combination of our inability to get into the housing market, plus historically stagnant wages and pensions not rising with costs of living. This already impacts a lot of gamers with disabilities, but it's going to impact gamers when they're living off a pension. Options such as Game Pass are ultimately going to, for many, become how we can afford to play new games. A small recurring fee for access to lots of games honestly is going to be more accessible to many 
than actually purchasing and owning new release titles as game costs balloon. Additionally, a variety of issues that come with old age impact memory and impulse control, as well as overall cognitive ability, in ways that will make many older people more susceptible to predatory microtransaction practices, which, as a social group that already has less money to begin with, is going to cause issues. This video definitely oversimplifies a lot of discussion around accessibility and accessibility support. If you want to get into the specifics of how we make things better for people with certain disabilities, I've got a whole series on YouTube, you can go watch all of my in-depth videos, but the main takeaway I want people to have from today is, even if right now you don't need any kind of accessibility support, the chances are high that if you want to keep playing into your 70s and 80s and you want to keep playing the video games you love, you're probably going to need some help to do that, and of all the things I listed today, there's no way to know in advance what support you're going to need. The only way to ensure that that support is there for you in the future is to make sure that every eventuality has accessibility support ready, just in case that's the one you need, just in case that's the one that prevents you from playing in your 70s and 80s. Even if video game accessibility doesn't impact you today, you should still care about it. And if you can't care about it because it impacts disabled people today, care about it out of self-interest if you must, because if you reach 75 years old and you can't play video games anymore because some piece of accessibility that you now need isn't there, you're gonna wish that you had cared about it more. You're gonna wish that when you were younger you had made more of a push to see that accessibility in place so that you could keep gaming in the future. If you can't care about it for other people, Care about it because eventually it's going to impact you.